Hey, this is Jakir King, and I'm at my studio, the LBT, in Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in Northern Virginia, and I was born in Washington, D.C., and uh, moved away from there in 1988 when I moved to San Francisco. I made my way to Nashville in 2000, and I've been, I've been here since. I really enjoyed growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, especially in the 80s. I graduated from high school in 1985, and, um, you know, there was, there was a really vital music scene back then. My younger brother and I would go to a lot of D.C. hardcore shows and punk shows and just all kinds of, all kinds of music. Go-go music, which is a sort of an early form of hip-hop, um, was, it comes from Washington, D.C., um, Bands like Bad Brains, um, Henry Rollins is just a little bit older than me, so there's a lot of stuff like that. Discord Records is there, and um, not necessarily that represents all my musical taste, but there was a lot of really cool music to go see at the time. There was a musical community there. There was there was stuff going on and, and studios around there, so um, it was excellent. I, where I grew up in Great Falls, Virginia. My the 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 house that I lived on, lived at grew up at, we had five acres, but our five acres was um, adjacent. My back door was just a, like a hundred yards from uh, the national park uh, that's there on the Potomac River. So I had a I had a huge area to explore and play and uh, and grow up in. So I I loved it. It was a great great place to grow up. I got into music probably because of my my love of my mother's record collection and my own 45s playing playing records on the hi-fi and and just um just how all that stuff made me feel when I was very young I wanted to be a radio DJ so I would uh record myself on a cassette sort of announcing records and I would I would play them on my mom's hi-fi uh in the living room and that sort of graduated into, I listened to a lot of music, a lot of, a lot of very different music. Uh, and, and then in high school, I played bass and guitar and my, I had friends in bands, just became very interested in the PA and the four track and all the sort of behind the scenes, behind the scenes stuff. I play a little bit of bass, uh, a little bit of guitar. I've never been a very disciplined musician and I haven't really ever stuck with it. I think. When I decided that I was interested in, in the, to explore how to make records in that process, uh, when that light bulb kind of went off, I decided to make the studio my instrument and um, to be able to express my musicality through the studio. I, you know, I, I can play a little bit of drums. I can play, I can play, I program a lot. So I definitely have a, an op understanding of composition and arrangement and structure and how all the different instrumentation works in in um, music making and a record record making process you wouldn't want me on your session as a st studio musician it's it's fine if there's some things that i can do and and have vision for and make happen on the records i'm making but that's kind of the extent of it my inspiration for deciding that i wanted to get into record making was i'm a big fan of Jimi hendrix and and as a teenager listening to those records i I had sort of had an epiphany with those particular records um, that Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Kramer, who was helping make those records, they were using the studio as a, a as a tool, as a as a way to manipulate what they're recording and the way they're capturing per, 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 the performances. And when that light bulb went off for me, um, I, I wanted to figure out how to do that. And I found in the back of Rolling Stone magazine, I found an advertisement for a program called the recording workshop which is uh it's in chillicothe ohio near columbus ohio and it's still uh it, the school still exists and and is still um teaching and i went there in 1987 and once i got out of that uh program i got a job in rockville maryland at a studio called balance sound and it just i just kind of went from there it's a lot of on the job training and you know the opportunities that i had to record the local bands and local artists at night on the, the cheaper hours was really formative. And I, I learned a lot. You, you'd often get artists that would come in and you would be, they'd be using you as the house engineer, but they were, wouldn't have a producer. 
So you would sort of help guide things along. And, and, and I realized I really enjoyed that part of the process and that um, although there's a lot of creativity that you can express as an engineer, having a voice um, in the in all the other things that a producer does was something I was very interested in. And, and it was just over time, it just sort of developed to um, maybe 10 years into my career, I decided that was something that I wanted to do. And, and having observed um, a lot of engineers and producers in the studio felt like it was something I could, I could um, enjoy and, and, and do well. I didn't really learn or assist at any great length of time with anyone in particular. Um, I would say that Eric Valentine is a very good friend of mine, and um, he came to a studio that I was the main assistant and primary engineer in one of the rooms uh, called Toast, and that was in San Francisco. And he came in with uh, the first Third Eye Blind record that he was producing, and um, I assisted him on that project. And he realized that I was pretty qualified, a little overqualified is what he told me to be an assistant. Um, so our friendship started there and he's an incredible talent and a great record maker. And um, I worked on several projects after that with him. So he was a bit, you know, a bit of a friend, a bit of a mentor. And um, David Bianco, Joe Ciccarelli, um, John Paterno, uh, John Paterno and I have been friends for a long time. I remember John was engineering a project that Joe Ciccarelli, so this is like super, super engineer uh, time here. Uh, Joe Ciccarelli was producing a project and he had John Paterno engineering. And at that same studio where I met Eric Valentine, um, I assisted uh, those guys. You know, that was fun. I mean, but overall, I didn't have a consistent mentor. I just sort of learned by doing and observing, just being a good student of every opportunity I could not just in the studio, but at shows um, and uh, working at nightclubs and, and anything, anything and everything that I could do. I'm doing uh, AV for conferences. There's just all kinds of things. I'm recording film for sound. I worked at uh, another studio in San Francisco called Russian Hill, and we primarily did um, advertising dialogue and sound for film, music for film, kind of that, that kind of a studio. So just a very, very varied experience and looked to do absolutely anything I could and just take it in like a sponge. Even when I was interning, uh, I just keep an open mind and open ear and just kind of catch any little part of a conversation or the sound coming down the hallway just to inform myself and just kind of keep after it. I'm not sure how long it took me to become... Uh, proud of the recordings I was making once I started. I think in retrospect, I was doing a much better job in the beginning than I thought I was, but there's a lot of, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of self-doubt along the way and your taste changes over time. And when I reflect back on how I was using some equipment then versus the way I use it now, I kind of didn't know what I was doing on some, some levels, but I also, I'm also the type of person that I'm able to move on and accept uh, work and um, just take it as an experience. And that if everyone was happy and it was a good experience, that that says that it's good. And it's always interesting when you listen to your work years later uh, or in a different atmosphere. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe there's things about it that y you wish you could do over or change, but if, it, if the intention is there and it, uh, it has the most important qualities of, um, of energy and emotion and it conveys something, then, I mean, some, there's, sure, there's things I cringe when I, when I hear it, but not, not a lot. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't, I try not to think about things like that. And I, I know that I'm still on a journey. It's a progression. I'm very accomplished and very seasoned at this point, but I'm still learning things and my taste is changing and I'm able to do things differently. So it's, it's just kind of a progression. I, I don't really ever want to be stuck in one place, so I don't really look too far into the past. I, I just look to the future. I'm, I'm grateful and proud for all the opportunities I've had and all the things I've done. Um, you know, incredibly proud of the time that um, I spent making records with Tom Waits because it was 
hugely informative to me in so many ways, uh, performance and sounds and recording techniques and just being bold. And I'm a huge Tom Waits fan. So, I mean, what a great opportunity. Um, I, I, I've worked with so many great artists. It, it's, uh, I couldn't sit here and list them all and make it sound very interesting. I'm just very really grateful for the journey I've had. And um, I, I try not to live with regrets. Just, just get on with it and have fun. I think there's always places you can point to in your career where um, there's turning points. I don't think that there was any one specific turning point. I've been really fortunate to have a lot of great things happen over a very long journey. And um, I can point to certain certain times when I was given opportunities to, to sort of advance. Um, mentioned my meeting Eric Valentine and assisting him on the first Third Eye Blind record. That he hired me later, subsequently, to be an engineer on on projects. And um, so I would say that that's one of the small turning points that gave me the ability to go from being primarily assistant engineer to an engineer. The first record that I mixed that sort of transformed me from being um, a, a pretty solid, notable, um, hardworking recording engineer was Modest Mouse's uh, good news for people who love bad news. I mixed that record and there were some pretty significant songs on that. And so then that sort of solidified me a little bit more as a mixer. And then another, I mentioned Tom Waits, that um, that was one of those things that also helped really solidify me as a recording engineer and a mixing engineer because I did mix that. So, you know, the Tom Waits, the result there was... Um, because Tom is a bit of an artist artist, a musician's musician. Uh, there's a lot of great artists that love his record. So that sort of helped me on that end of things. Modest Mouse helped me a little bit more in terms of record label uh, and A&R profile, manager's profiles. It's a progression. Uh, you know, Kings of Leon, Only by the Night, the success there. Uh, I, was an en I was the engineer. I was the mixer. I was a producer. The success of that sort of helped solidify my my role as a as a producer and so you just kind of keep it's a progression and and there isn't i mean i could go on and on with little little turning points and things decisions that i made uh things that happened to me um people i knew the relationships i formed um but honestly it's been such a long journey um that i wouldn't credit any one singular thing for it it's a, it's really a combination of a lot of great things and some really lean and hard times too. Others, I will not pretend to say that it's all been easy. And there weren't many times or uh, years at a time where I had plateaued and I didn't feel like things were progressing and I was frustrated. You know, 20 years ago, I was still painting houses sometimes. It just, it just depends, but um, no regrets. And I'm just very fortunate uh, to be where I am and do something I love and and I'm here to, to, to share my experience with you and hopefully, you know, transfer some of that knowledge and wisdom so that you can take a real positive journey yourself. The things that I like to do to kind of expand my growth is I like to, even though I may not, may not be my musical taste, I like to see what's going on on the charts. Um, and not just, and I'm not talking just about like what charts on Billboard, but people's like playlists on Spotify and just explore, ask musicians that come in the studio what they're listening to. Um, I watch, I watch some of the same content on Pure Mix that you're, that you watch. I, um, I watch YouTube stuff. I experiment with the new plugins and the new gear that comes out. I listen to all, all genres of music, all styles of record making just to find inspiration and and try things out. Um, I have a team of engineers that uh, most of them are younger than me. Um, and you know, I, I, I sort of let them be them themselves, uh, and try their, their own recording techniques and, and sort of, you know, a, a learn and adapt from that. It's just, it's a constant progression. I, I am not someone that constantly does things the same way. I don't think that I figured out how to do something and I just stick to that. I'm constantly tinkering with things and 
looking to improve. And so I listen to you know, tons of music and, and try and make mental notes about how structures are changing or what structures are appropriate to different genres and how things are arranged, what sounds people are using. I have the benefit of having giving seminars occasionally and really interacting with people and and asking questions about other music that's being made. The way I also try to choose projects, I, I try to do things that I always feel like I will be able to do a good job with it, that I like the people that I'm working with, that I can creatively invest myself, and that there is some sort of challenge in there for me, that I'm going to stretch myself in some way because it's maybe, I feel, I feel like I can pretty much get the hang of anything in the studio. Just want to try and challenge myself in a beneficial way and, and stretch myself. I also really expect that the people that I'm working with and for, they will be, they'll be honest and critical of, I don't, of me and sort of push me um, and put myself in situations where I I'm, can be vulnerable and exposed a little bit because I feel like I can, I can get in there and I can do it. I can be successful. Um, but I don't want to always work from a safe place necessarily. I'm, I'm always interested to explore. And, um, you know, it's inspiring even to just be on this platform and share this information because um, I will get feedback um, and um, just kind of a community experience. And I like to grow from that. It's a lot. It's a life journey. It's, a, it's something that consumes me quite a bit. So it's easy to just stay, stay in it. Okay, the whole thing about analog versus digital, console versus in the box. We're at a we're at a point in uh, we're at a point in recorded history technology where I honestly uh, feel like it's a choice. I mean, no, they're not the same thing. Is one better than the other? Um, depends on your taste. I think they're of equal quality. I think you can make a great record on either. Some things are more convenient or um, having limitations of certain things is a good, is a good thing. I think that a combination of things doing just stuff in the box, it's all fine. It's, it really is. It's at a point now where the technology does not inhibit the, the ability to be creative and do something that is vital and creative. I don't necessarily do things in one format, uh, exclusively at all. It, it, part of it is for some people, it's just, it's in a workflow that they enjoy. And it's uh, because they're, they are, even though I think that they're all equals in, in some way, I think you can make a fantastic, professional, engaging, emotional, cool, whatever, however, whatever descriptors you want to use. I think you can make a, an amazing record in any format. It really comes down to where your creative comforts are. I use them all in various combinations. It really depends partially on what I feel like is going to be my best path technically to allow me to be the most creative. And I, it's not that I don't want to work hard technically to get a great result. I just want to do it the smartest possible way. It's not the same for every record, every process. And it also depends on what the people that I'm working with want to enjoy and how they want to enjoy it and what their vision of the record making process is. I think mixing in the box, primarily in the box, is, uh, is great. I either mix completely in the box or I mix in the box with some external summing. I very rarely, in the last couple of years, I have gotten away from using my analog gear in the mix process, other than my console, other than a way to sum things down in the mix process, just because it's gotten so good in the box. Um, you know, companies like Universal Audio and what they are doing with their Apollos and uh, the Unison pre technology and all of the all the software that's available and all the emulations available, um, recording is 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 approaching a similar place. I mean, there's been so much effort and time spent with everybody mixing in the box. That's, that's at a really solid place. The recording process, it's still, you know, there's some things emerging that are really great tools, but primarily for me, I end up, because I have a lot of great old gear, I record with all these 
wonderful pieces of analog equipment and then I primarily mix in the box. Um, so it's just, it's just whatever, it really, really is whatever gets the job done in a inspired and creative way. To me, there is no argument about what's, which one is better than the other. That's a matter of opinion at this point, even though that's my opinion. Um, it, it's just, it's a waste of breath and a waste of energy to, to insist that one is better than the other. If you're stuck on that, you're not thinking about the right thing and you're not being creative and you're not thinking about what's actually more important in the record making process. And that's just the way I feel about it. My DAW of choice is Pro Tools, just because I've been using it for forever. Uh, probably been using it for 25 years. I don't know, more, do the math. Even before it was Pro Tools, I've been using it. Um, I, do I think it is the perfect solution? No. Um, I know how to get around in Ableton a little bit. I've used Logic uh, over the years. I think it's a great sounding platform, but I just default to Pro Tools because it's what most of the industry uses. It's the most simple and streamlined in terms of the way recording studio technology and, and the process works in a traditional sense. It's kind of the one that makes the most sense. It, it was sort of purpose built for recording multi-track audio where a lot of other uh, DAWs were designed primarily from a um, programming MIDI kind of creation standpoint. And so there, it's a little bit more convoluted in some of them how to uh, address recording and editing and, and manipulating audio. Um, but I mean, there's so many, so many good things out there. It's the same as analog versus digital. It's, it's like whatever, whatever, I mean, I know people that make great records in Cubase and Performer as well. It's, it, it's really whatever fits your workflow and your thinking process. But I, I primarily, almost exclusively use Pro Tools in terms of multi-tracking and building uh, the record, a record and mixing a record. I believe the process of mixing and recording can be greatly informed by one another. Um, I know for a fact that I became a better recording engineer when I became a pretty proficient mixer because then I understood what it is that I wanted my recorded tracks to sound like when I was mixing. Um, so becoming a better mixer made me a better recording engineer. And, and as you are able to record better records. It helps make you a better mixer because you are doing less work as a mixer and you realize what the most important aspects of mixing are and you don't get bogged down in as much minutia. But at the same time, I think being a good recording engineer, a good mixer makes me a better producer because I understand what's essential and what's important and being a good pro producer, you know, they all just feed off of each other. And I think that they're hugely important. And although they don't necessarily, all those skills for me, for sure, didn't develop at the same speed, um, partially because of opportunity. And you, I think you really have to learn to record well first um, and be on some sessions to understand how to manage them as a producer. Um, and, you know, and then get to the place where you've, you're seasoned enough as an engineer that you can start to mix because mixing is a, mixing is a, a, a very uh, advanced and developed skill in engineering. If you can invest some time in being a better recording engineer, it will help your mixing and, and vice versa, you know, on and on. It's really hard. Uh, I, th I enjoy the interaction with people. I love mixing so much. Um, and I love bringing it all together and the, the interaction of, of that feeling of completion and triumph and, uh, it just kind of putting a, a nice bow on it. But um, I think if I had to choose one thing, I guess a recording engineer slash producer, because I really just enjoy being in the moments of when stuff gets captured and figuring out how to make that happen. Being the producer in those moments and, and uh, having those experiences, I think is, the, is the, where I get the most fun. And, you know, when I hear a song out in public, and I have flashbacks of the process. I don't really think that much about the mixing. I think about 
the moment in the studio when it came together and the track was being recorded or the, the essential parts of it and how that felt and knowing that's, that um, the sort of the magic was happening and, and the energy you get from other people, that's, that's what I would choose as, the, as the, the one and only thing. There isn't really much about the process that I don't, don't love. It just, I try to avoid the situations where I'm with people that I feel like don't get it or, or not willing to work together to arrive at uh, what feels like an accomplished, finished place. Most of the time when I hear the music that I worked on come on the radio or hear it in a supermarket or whatever, I think it's just very exciting. I just get a thrill out of it. I think I'm I think I'm a little bit past the anxiety part of um it sounding weird or something because I know at this point that given the environment or the the, the playback system that it's going to sound a little bit different. Um but hopefully I I'm able at this point to do put it together in a way that it always the most important things there are, are there that will translate and that's what I listen to and that's what I'm trying to think about and take on when I listen to music I mean obviously I can listen to it in a very analytical way and decipher some record making techniques and and this and that um but I think I'm well past that fortunately where I don't I don't get bogged down in the in the analytical stuff I can switch it on when I want to I listen to music mostly uh, for the enjoyment, and I just get a thrill when I hear music that I've worked on out in you know public space or out in the real world. And and I've also come to realize that because I've made records that I wished I could have done, I think it's like oh, I could have done a better job or it didn't turn out as good as I thought it could. And I don't take that all all on myself because that's not all up to me. But even though some of those records where I don't necessarily have the best possible feeling I could, someone will tell me like how much that record means to them um, and how good they think it sounds or, or just they resonate with it. And so it, it, it has taught me over time that if, if you pay attention to the right things making a record and music goes out in the world, it will affect people. And not, maybe not everybody positively. Maybe there's a, a lot of people that don't, won't resonate with it and like it, but it will affect somebody. It will mean something to someone most of the time. And that's what's important. And um, that's what I try to think about. And I just just enjoy the opportunity to experience that and share that with people. And that's, that's sort of where my headspace is. It has to have some, some integral truths in it. Um, now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean to say that the song has to be based on factual emotions or something that's terribly relatable. It's, I don't mean that the, a truth is not necessarily that it speaks, lyrically speaks a truth. It's does, does it feel genuine? Does it have uh, an honest element of performance and energy? Does it challenge some things? Does it, does it have a vital feeling and energy? Does it, does it feel real on some level? Does it feel inspiring? And I mean, it's maybe it's a little hard to see, well, how do you how do you quantify those things? It's um, I think it for me, it's just having listened to a lot a lot of music and identified with a lot of things that other people identify with and discerning and acknowledging what is most important about those records. Don't get me wrong, as an engineer and mixer, do I think the sound of a record is important? Well, absolutely I do. A lot of my career has been based on some of the success of those efforts. But in the end, I know that a great song or a great song vibe, a rhythm, uh, a performance, the perspective and energy and vibe that's captured in a record and the way that it's expressed is what is that's the that's the most important thing because if you get those things right then it will sound good a good sound does not make a, a good record a good record is made by having the right um content the right performances and then that's what makes it sound great
to me, making a record for an unknown artist versus a known artist, they're a different experience. They're equally satisfying to me. I, I enjoy them both. I want to be with people that want to make a great record and they want to put forth the effort. And you hopefully are aligning yourself and in opportunities where the unknown artist and the known artist have just as much passion and energy for the process. It's a different process because with a known artist, they have, a, they have experience, they have a track record, they have an identity that they either want to advance and change or they want to stick with. Um, and they, you know, they have a, they have a base of knowledge already making records. And so uh, you're meeting them in a different place. The conversation can be a little different. And there's some things that you can fast track that you don't necessarily get the opportunity with an unknown artist, a less established artist. But the, the, the process when the unknown artist is a little bit, it's a newer experience for them. So you get the, you get the energy of, it being an, uh, a new experience and sort of some of that stuff unknown, you get to, to look at helping them with the early part of the journey. Um, there's some, you know, there's some teaching moments and, and sometimes their lack of knowledge is kind of can be good for creative situations and inspiring just because they're asking for things that they don't really understand um, what the normal way to or whatever process would be to do it. And so you have to, you sort of have to stretch and meet them in that place. There's good energy and good experience on both ends of the spectrum. And they're just different experiences. And I enjoy them both. I, I like to try to mix it up. I like to, during the course of a year, um, work with, if possible, with both types of artists so that, um, you know, I just, I feel invigorated and inspired from different uh, angles and different experiences. How does it feel to have turned my passion into a business? It's the best feeling in the world. Um, I feel, I mean, I feel, I feel so lucky. I feel so, it feels so cool to be able to show up to my own studio and know that people want to make records with me and that the people that work with me most of the time walk away with a, with a satisfying experience. Even if, even if, even if that's the extent of it, that, um, just a good time was had and that we worked hard uh, for, for a great result of it, you know, at all possible. And then by a great result, does I don't mean that it has to be s successful out, like it sold a million records. It's just like, does it, does it have meaning? Was it, was it a meaningful experience making the record? Does everyone that was involved in that part of it feel in, uh, enriched and satisfied? Yeah, it just, it, it feels great that I can live out my passion and, and dream and that it, you know, it feeds my family and uh, allows me to, to buy gear and go on vacation and make more records and just, just live, a, just live a life. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I couldn't ask for more really. I mean, I've already, in terms of my hopes and dreams, when I started out the being skilled, um, and capable at my desired, um, job, if you will. I have, a, I always have a hard time calling it a job or work those because it's, it's neither really silly little things. Like I wanted to have a gold record with my name on it. Um, and at a certain point it's like, Oh, it'd be cool to win a Grammy. Um, I used to work at a record store when I was a teenager and I would look at the back of the records and I'd see people's names on there. And I remember telling my mom maybe when I was maybe 17, it's like, I would really love to be able to walk into a record store one day and see my name on the back of a record. All those little silly things, um, they've happened and I'm very, very grateful for it. And so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm living my dream. I'm just, I'm super stoked about it. I mean, how could you not be? I handled the business side um, pretty much on as much of my own terms as possible. Uh, I have had managers along the way and they have been a great deal of help. They've been great people uh, in my career. But I am sort of at a place, and I'm the type of person that I like to be my own filter. I like to be my own my own business voice. I just feel a lot better being that connection, if you will. There's always negotiation involved when there's money involved, and recording process is expensive, and there's timelines, and there's expectations, and um, there's a lot of people involved. I just like, even though it's a lot of work. I like being at the center of it because 
I take all this very personally. And when I'm in the room with the artist, I want to, um, I want to, I don't want to feel like that there's a conversation that's going on that is being had in the background and I'm pretending um, like I don't know about it or they don't know about it. I just don't like, I don't like doing things like that. I'm, I'm very, I like to be upfront, honest, to the point, you know, and, and then the music business outside of me, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the music business has always been kind of crazy uh, in terms of where people place value on things and how record labels uh, evaluate and uh, market and, and just do stuff. Um, you know, managers, uh, labels, um, publishing. I mean, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's evil. I mean, it's, there's a lot of dysfunction, but, I, but that's also a reason why I like to represent myself because I just like to kind of cut through that stuff. And I just want to be as clear as possible. It's unfortunate that the record sales have kind of died off, um, that everything is sort of more turned into a, a streaming platform. Um, but that's the way I consume music. I'm not someone that only goes to the record store and buys vinyl or CDs or whatever. Um, I consume most of my music the same way that most of the rest of the world does. And so I'm not going to be not going to be upset about it. I'm, I embrace it. It's just kind of what's cool. I mean, there's so much more available to me at, at my fingertips. Uh, because of it. It's healthy. There's a lot of technology that like, like lets a lot of people make records. Does it, does it in some ways, do I feel like it uh, over-democratizes it to the point of where some of the work at the professional level has suffered? Yeah, a little bit. But, but there's also platforms like Pure Mix that um, you're, you have access to some people that have knowledge and experience and better records will get made because of it. Um, I think everything, I, I try to just be, I'm more like glass half full and I just like to be positive about it. If you're willing as an artist and I include myself as an artist to, to do the work, um, and get yourself out there, there's, there's money to be made. You can make a living at it. So I'm just trying to keep positive about it. I think that's, I think there's so many tremendous things out there. I guess stay true to yourself, which I mostly did, but but be patient. I think I had a lot of I had a lot of points in my career where I lost patience and I became overly frustrated. And I think that it um, at times with certain 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 situations, certain certain interactions um, didn't provide for the best outcomes or put me in the best light at times, um, just because that frustration sort of felt kind of overwhelming. There's so much to learn and there's, there's such a big, it's such a big journey in the music business and to, to, to hone this craft that, um, I've always been, I've always been tenacious and persistent. I never, I never gave up, but the attitude in which I sort of carried myself at certain times, I think if I could give myself, go back and give myself a piece of advice, um, that would be it. Cause there's probably some things along the way that I could have enjoyed more if I had I had been more patient and I was, and was more present at times and probably it had been more beneficial at, the, at that period of time. Other than that, I, I, you know, I try not to have any regrets, but that's something I work on a lot in my life in general is just, it's just patience and balance now. So if I could go back, that would be the thing I would, that I would give myself. If I could give some advice to those of you who are st starting out, um, obviously you need to create huge long-term goals but temper your short-term expectations of yourself. Realize that talent and information does not equal uh, the capability to execute early on. It's, it's some of this stuff is a learned skill. So set goals, set big goals, set big, um, big goals far into the future, set realistic goals for the short term that lead you to, that are a, pro a natural progression towards the long term. Um, but give yourself a little bit of grace, um, along the way and understand that there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of hats to wear. And, um, just because you see somebody else do something well, uh, and then maybe you're a little bit slower at it, or that's not maybe where your skill set is developed, uh, to the fullest or to your expectation, just, just work on it. Be, be really, be very realistic about evaluating yourself and what to work on. All of us have things that we're good at 
and not as good at. And to be well-rounded, you need to um, understand the, what those things are about yourself, um, not spend too much time on the things that you're good at, spend the majority of, the thing, of your time on the things you're not as good at. Like always be bringing up the rear. Whatever, whatever feels like the weakest skill where you need to spend the most time, do that. It will, it will make the things that you're better at even better. I'm doing Pure Mix because it's uh, because I love Fab and his platform. It's not the only platform out there. It's not the only way I like to share information, but it's um, it's very well thought out. It's very comprehensive. There's a lot of great mentors. Um, you get really insightful, realistic, valuable information, and to be invited in and participate in that um, is. Uh, you know, it's exciting to me. I like I like sharing. I uh, I grow from sharing what I know. People have helped me along the way and shared with me, and I've been invited into environments and had the and have the have had the privilege to be in some pretty exclusive environments and see some pretty special things happen. And to be able to to share that experience and to teach, I, it's really gratifying to me. Over the years that I've had. Many assistant engineers and people have been interns for me and, and developed with me as I've been developing. Um, it creates lasting friendships. I see the impact it has on them and then, then the people that they go on to impact. It's just a cool thing to be part of. It just feels like a community. I like being part of a community. I like the opportunity to, to influence and impact someone. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to make copies of myself. I'm just... I'm trying to inspire someone to be their their best, and by me sharing what I know and an ex, and a common experience and some wisdom, uh, I'm sort of helping open a door for someone, and that's a very satisfying feeling. That's um, I just get a lot of I get get a lot of satisfaction out of it, and um, and meaning, and having all this uh, experience and ability would not be as meaningful to me personally. If I if I wasn't sharing it, um, so that um, other people can grow and and uh, and share in these experiences, and as I'm helping people in a very present way in the studio with me, and I'm mentoring them, they're helping me. Uh, so it's just it's just kind of a win win, and I just I love that part of it.